everyone who's in Unity Village watching this and everybody who's everywhere else. I wanted to do a, just a little hello with a full face uh, before moving over to the PowerPoint. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. So let's just share. Here we go. We're going to be talking about stories from Kansas City and other cosmic destinations. How does that sound? So I am from Kansas City. And as anyone from Kansas or Kansas City, Missouri will tell you, there is no place like home. And I so, so wish that I could be there with you. Unfortunately, I can't. I have to be super careful about respiratory illnesses because way back in 1994, I was traveling in France and got a terrible, terrible flu. It's the only time in this life that I almost left my body and moved on to the next adventure. I didn't, but it was a long, long recovery. To this day, I have tinnitus in my left ear because I had to fly before I was completely well. And I also don't have wonderful, perfect vegan lungs that I would had had this not happened to me. But as we know, as spiritual beings, having a spiritual experience, even terrible, terrible things come with gifts and lessons and blessings. So one of the gifts that I got from being so sick all those years ago was that the first night that I finally felt well enough to go out was Christmas Eve, so I went to church. I was living in Kansas City then. My church was Unity Temple on the plaza. So if you're visiting from afar and you get a chance to go into the city and do a little tour of the sites and maybe the uh, vegan sites, get yourself to Cafe Gratitude and uh, some of the Unity sites too, Unity Temple on the plazas, the Founders Church was built in 1947. And that night they were doing a Christmas Eve candle lighting service. So everyone went up to the altar and we were given a candle to light from one of our neighbors and wrapped around the bottom of our candle was a Bible verse. And mine came from Isaiah, whom I'm crazy about anyway, because he's the one who has prophesied the wonderful vegan future to look forward to. It said, arise shine your light has come and the glory of the lord has risen upon you well as somebody who thought i might never again get out of bed that seemed so apropos and so beautiful and i think of it as a blessing for all of us in our activism in our outreach first we need to arise we need to get up and show up and write our letter or carry our sign or go on our podcast or do whatever it is we're supposed to do then we get to shine this is our attraction activism like they say in the 12-step programs when you have something that somebody else wants they will do what you did to get it and your light has come the way i see things your light has never been anywhere else that that light at our center is what really connects us a lot of times we'll say, well, we're vegan because we're all one. We're one with the animal kingdom. We are one with everybody. And it's always been that way. We just need to remember. So I started remembering before I even knew that I had forgotten back when I was five years old, Carol alluded to it in the introduction. I had a nanny because my parents both worked and this was before daycare. So she was this wonderful, eccentric grandmother aged woman who was very much in unity and she'd studied lots of spiritual teachings in her life. So I came home from first grade having memorized the four food groups and proudly recited them to her. And she wasn't all that enthused about it. She's one of those people who didn't want governments and authorities telling her what to do. You may have met someone like that. And she said, Humph, I could take you to a place and get you a hamburger made out of peanuts and you'd think you were having beef. Why, there are people who never eat any meat. They're called vegetarians. Lots of people in unity are vegetarians. 
Well, this place with the peanut burger is Unity Inn, where you guys are having your wonderful meals during the forum and retreat. Now, by the time I came along, I would have gone to Unity Village where you are, and we would have had the hamburger there. We never really did it because Dee Dee couldn't drive. <laughs> we couldn't get there from Kansas City. But at that time, um, the Unity Inn was the previous version of the one where you're dining now. And it was no longer fully vegetarian, but there was always one vegetarian entree. The soups had no beef broth or chicken broth. The pie crusts had no lard. So somebody was trying to keep things going. And I think it was a, a beautiful man, uh, Lowell Fillmore, one of the Fillmore's sons who stayed vegetarian. But I just want to show you this picture of the original Unity Inn. This was back when everything was vegetarian. Ninth and Tracy is on the outskirts of downtown Kansas City. At its height, they were serving 1,900 meals a day. They had a van actually made by the Rolls-Royce company that would go into downtown Kansas City and pick people up, take them back, and they would just do all of these beautiful, lavish meals. They had cookbooks. They were very much ahead of their time. And I think maybe that's what we're being called upon to be. It feels like, oh no, we're very much in our time. This is the time when this is supposed to happen, but we're still a little bit ahead. And that's why everybody hasn't caught up. Now, as a kid, I was always a strange little girl who was much more interested in heaven than earth. And finally, in seventh grade, I found a friend who shared this interest. Her name was Rebecca Gott, and her mother had a wonderful library of all kinds of books, many of them, the ones that you see about Christian mysticism. So we tried to read them, and we certainly carried them around. And sometimes we slept with one of them under our pillows, just figuring that the closer that we could get to all all of this beautiful, brilliant truth, the better everything would be. Later, as I got through high school and had actually tried a couple of times to be vegan, I remember, or vegetarian, I hadn't heard of vegan, but my, my vegetarian adventure at age 13 was to eat cottage cheese and fruit cocktail for six weeks. And I got so hungry, it just didn't work. But I made a promise to myself that one day I would understand all this. I would know how to do it and I would do it. Well, when I was 17, still wasn't vegetarian, but trying to live a wonderful life and do good things in the world. And I had not been invited to the prom. Well, Instead of going to the prom, I was going to go to the 48 hour peace vigil that was happening at a big park on the country club plaza, the same area that the Unity Temple was in. And what I learned was that a whole lot of the protesters figured that it wouldn't make that much of a difference to the war if they went home around 11 o'clock and slept in their own bed and came back in the morning. But I was committed. I was staying. I was camping. I was there. There were maybe four or five young women and two young men, both Quakers. We were singing folk music and we saw two other young men coming toward us thinking maybe they'd want to sing some folk music too. But when they got closer, we knew that blowing in the wind was not on their mind. They were quite intoxicated and they wanted a fight. So the two young men, the Quakers stood up and invited these other men to sit, to have some soda, to discuss. But instead, the other two, we'll just call them uh, John Barleycorn and Jack Daniels, started punching. And they were punching, punching, punching these two young Quaker men who stood there with their arms at their sides. And after about 45 seconds, 60, 90, I'm not sure. It wasn't a huge amount of time, but I know that if I had been the one being punched, it would have seemed a lot longer. These two men looked as if they had seen a ghost, not Casper, the scary kind. And they hightailed and ran as if someone was chasing them with a shotgun. I was never the same after that. You see, I'd witnessed two words 
that I'd come across in the books on yoga that I was reading at the time. That was when there were three books about yoga in the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library. And I read them all over and over again. One of those words was ahimsa, which is nonviolence. I knew about nonviolence from watching the civil rights marches on TV, but I had never witnessed what it took to practice it in real life until that night in the park in Kansas City. Another word that I learned that night that I'd only read before was satyagraha. That means truth force. That was what Mahatma Gandhi called his movement to free India through nonviolent means of the colonial rule by England. Truth force. You see, I always knew truth was good. You're supposed to tell the truth. I had heard that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Truth got in there must be important. But what I saw that night in the park on the country club plaza was that truth isn't just good. Truth is a power. When the two attackers felt the power of that truth, they were scared to death. They couldn't take it. It was strong. It was mighty. And they ran. And I knew that I couldn't live an ordinary life and that even without the corsage, what had happened that night was better than any prom. So I moved to London. First, I graduated high school. I got a job for nine months, saved all my money, and moved to what seemed to me the most remarkable place on earth, and it turned out to be. Now, I remembered my Quaker friends from the peace movement, so I started attending Quaker meetings at the Friends Meeting House near Trafalgar Square, and I also discovered the most magnificent bookshop. It's still there, Watkins Books in Cecil Court. It's a spiritual bookstore. I'd never known there was such a thing. And when I wandered into that bookstore, I realized how big spirituality was and and how filling it was of every part of our being because in Watkins they didn't just have sections about Christianity and Judaism and Islam and Hinduism they had sections about social justice they had sections about ecology a word that I had to look up and when I learned that it had to do with care of the earth I had to work with that because I thought we were supposed to be focused on heaven. What's all this care of earth? But then I started to learn that there is nowhere that God is not. There is no one in whom God does not dwell. I was getting quite an education, even though I'd gone to London to study fashion. Now, I was also taking yoga at this time. And at Watkins, I found lots more yoga books than three. And I started my road to being seriously vegetarian. You can see the picture here of Cranks. Cranks had lots of health food shops and restaurants all over London. And you could go and get bean patties and lentil mash and lots of wonderful brown vegetarian food because back then we ate a lot of brown food. We hadn't learned about bright, fresh fruits and vegetables so much yet, but you know what? We did okay. I made it to Pescatarian in London, and when I returned to Kansas City the following year, I went all the way. Now, unfortunately, it didn't do me so well. And you who are in unity and know the power of the mind will just say, oh, yeah, I could have told you that. Because I was in Weight Watchers, and at that time, Weight Watchers said, you have to eat fish five times a week. So I was doing okay as a vegetarian. I was kind of fudging on some of their rules, but I was still eating the fish five times a week. And when I stopped, I knew that I would gain a huge amount of weight. And guess what happened? I stopped eating fish and I gained a huge amount of weight, not from lack of fish, but from what I believed. So I didn't want people to see me in Kansas City. I was so embarrassed. In fact, I'd been accepted into the ministerial school at Unity. 
but I was so embarrassed that I was so large that I called them two days before school was to start and said that I wasn't coming. So I still wanted to do something spiritual. So I moved to Wheaton, Illinois uh, to work in the library of the Theosophical Society. And while I was there, one of my coworkers, young man, Nathaniel Altman, he was working as a groundskeeper because whenever they got a young man, <laughs> they made them be a groundskeeper. But after hours, he was working on the first book about vegetarianism to come in the whole 20th century. Now he had an elect a manual typewriter and I had at my desk in the library an electric typewriter. So I typed his book. And you know, when you type a book, you get more out of it than when you just read it. And as I typed that book, I also thought, maybe someday I can write a book. Around this time, I found out about veganism. This is Jay and Freya Dinshaw. Jay has passed away. He founded the American Vegan Society in 1960. Now that in and of itself is an aha, because 1960 was really the 50s. I mean, Eisenhower was president. How could somebody think that the United States was ready for a vegan society? Well, Jay was a very far-sighted person. And Freya has been doing the wonderful work ever since. Uh, and just this year, the American uh, Vegan Society has founded the American Vegan Center in Philadelphia in the historic region. So if you ever visit there and you want to go to Constitution Hall and see the Liberty Bell, then you'll also want to stop in at the American Vegan Center. So Freya is still working hard. I spoke with her several months ago, and she said she thinks that she may retire at 86. Six, probably a pretty good time to do that. Now I say there in the notes, they never gave up on me. That is so important. So wherever you are on your journey, please never give up on yourself because one step back really can be the prelude to two steps forward. And also we don't wanna give up on other people, whether it's our great, wonderful relative or friend that we really wish would see the light about diet or whatever it is, you know what? Don't give up on them. They have their path, they have their journey. So I did all sorts of slipping and sliding as a vegan because I did have a binge eating disorder. And whenever that thing would flare up, it was just too hard to stand in the 7-Eleven and find vegan things to binge on because I'd read the labels and they all ended up having some kind of whey in there or some egg albumin. Terrible, terrible thing. But Jay and Freya never gave up on me. And eventually I became vegan right on time. So I went to school, not to be a unity minister, but to get a bachelor's degree in comparative religions. And I earned a fellowship. I could study anything as long as I left North America to do it. So I went back to England. And there I wrote the paper, which became my first book, Compassion, the Ultimate Ethic and Exploration of Veganism. As far as I know, it was the first book on veganism ever to come from a regular publisher. And when I was there, I met the most remarkable people. There was a movie playing at that time called Meetings with Remarkable Men about the spiritual teacher Gurdjieff. But I had meetings with remarkable women and men the one you see in the middle is Muriel, the Lady Doubting. So if you remember your World War II history, it was her husband, Chief Air Marshal Lord Doubting, who masterminded the Battle of Britain. They're both buried in Westminster Abbey and Lord Doubting has a, a wonderful stained glass window. But they were also animal rights activists. Now you see her here in what looks like an ermine robe. Well, it's not because everybody at their level of peerage had to wear the same kind of robe for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. They managed to get very passable faux fur in 1952. How did they do that? Where, who would even know where to go for faux fur in 1952? 
But when you really want to do the right thing, when you really want to move things forward, sometimes you get some extra help. And this woman on the right, Kathleen Janaway, was another remarkable human that I met when I was doing the research for that first book. She was telling me what it was like to be part of the vegan society in the 1940s. She said, we didn't know if our bones would disintegrate or if we'd perish in a fortnight. We did this out of pure, disinterested compassion. And I'm thinking, when I grow up, I want to be you. Well, I grew up, <laughs> I had a baby, Rachel Adair. And you know, it's, it's a magical experience. It's a spiritual experience to be a parent, to raise a child. But it's really special to raise a child vegan because you get to see the connection that they have with animals and you never have to have the uncomfortable conversation of, well, we pet them when we're here and we eat them when we're here. So from the time that she was really little, Adair was an animal rights activist, always wanting to go to the demonstrations. The picture on the right is 1990, the uh, Animal Rights March in Washington, DC. And the one in the middle is 1991, when we were able to travel to some amazing places, uh, India, Nepal, this is Tibet. Our guide, was supposed to pick us up at the Lhasa airport, but instead he was drunk at the Holiday Inn. So we had no guide and you're not supposed to be left alone in Tibet without somebody watching you. So we managed to bribe our way into the city and bribe our way into a hotel room and bribe our way into being, to, being able to spend two weeks in Lhasa. So word got around that there were some Americans with nobody watching them. So all of these beautiful Tibetan people in their native attire, as you're seeing with these two women, would show up at our door with notes or little gifts for their relatives in Nepal or India or in the States. And a lot of these people had us over for dinner. Well, they're very devout Buddhists. They're Mahayana Buddhists. So that's the kind of Buddhism that knows what Buddha said about eating animals. He said, don't do it. And yet Tibet is a place where it's virtually impossible to be vegan really, really hard to be vegetarian because nothing grows there. The city is at 12,000 feet. The earth is, is very, very thin. And so the Buddhists don't want to kill the animals. And there's a small Muslim community that runs the slaughterhouse, but they don't like doing it. And so we would go to dinner at these people's homes and somehow they would feed us these sumptuous vegan meals it was very embarrassing to think how much money it must have cost them. And then they would always leave and they wouldn't eat with us. And this happened time after time. And finally, I spoke with someone who understands the culture and he said, but you're vegan. So they think that you're some kind of high spiritual personages and that you wouldn't eat with regular people, which of course was a heartbreak because I'm regular people and they're high spiritual personages. But these were the kinds of exciting things that happened as Adair grew up. And I just wanted to bring you up to date with her. This is Adair today. She's a professional aerialist and stunt performer and all that muscle comes from plants. So I believe that this is the age of the vegan miracle. And think about this in your own life and your own activism. Have you been wanting to do something and it just seemed like it's just not going to happen. This is just star crossed, but then it does something miraculous, something that's, that's out of the ordinary happens because you're going to do some good with that. So I want to invite you around these pictures in a counterclockwise motion. So we see Michael Moore at the top. My husband and I were walking up Broadway 
And there was Michael Moore. He's so famous, you can recognize him from the back. And we did. And I didn't want to seem like a fangirl, but he did like a book that I had written. He'd done a review in Oprah's magazine. So I just gave my card to the woman who was with him and walked on up Broadway. But after a few seconds, I hear Victoria and Michael Moore is following us up Broadway. And after we exchanged pleasantries, he said, we need to talk. We need to talk about food. So he says that he's going to call me. And I'm thinking, of course you are. I have so many Academy Award winners calling me. It's getting to be really annoying. But lo and behold, he did. And on one of these calls, I said, the book that I'm writing is supposed to be called Main Street Vegan, but the publisher doesn't like that. And they say I have to change the title and get rid of Main Street. And he said, they're wrong. Let me talk to them. So we had a three-way call and Michael Moore convinced my editor who was able to convince the higher ups that Main Street Vegan was my title. And as soon as I knew that, it's almost like those bubbles in the comic books or the graphic novels. It's like, there should be Main Street Vegan Academy. There should be a Main Street Vegan radio show. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a podcast then. There should be a Main Street Vegan production company where you work with filmmakers on their wonderful vegan films. And all those things started to happen. I was on tour with the book. I had already put in place the first Main Street Vegan Academy program to happen when I got back from the book tour. And while I was traveling, I remember I was staying in Dallas with a wonderful woman who had five dogs and a very large pot belly pig who lived in the house and was utterly charming. And the phone rang. And it was the woman who at that time was in charge of Unity Online Radio. And she said, do you want to have a radio show? You can call it Main Street Vegan. It's about time we got back to our roots, the roots of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, who were very vocal vegetarians, as no one knows better than Reverend Carol Saunders, who's there with you. So I started doing the show. In the beginning, my daughter was doing it with me because she had helped out with the book. And then she moved on to other things. And one day I was doing the live show that was before everybody was used to podcasts and, and always listening at their leisure, which is what I do now, too. But we had a giveaway, a book giveaway. And the person who called to win the book was Thomas Jackson that you see there in the other picture. And when he gave his information to the engineer to get the book, he left his contact info and asked if I would call him. So I did. And he said, will you produce my movie? And I'm thinking, I don't know how to produce a movie. And then he said, it's about veganism and spirituality. Now, if he had said, would you produce my movie about veganism? I would have said, I don't know how to produce a movie. And if he had said, I'm going to do a movie about spirituality, would you like to produce it? I would have said, I don't know how to produce a movie. But he said, it's about veganism and spirituality. How could I say no to that? So I said yes and figured I would learn later. I kind of got that from my daughter. She was in um, doing just background work for a movie called Revolutionary Road. Maybe you saw it. It was a very depressing divorce movie, so I don't recommend it. But it had Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. And when the director saw her, he liked how she looked and asked if she could do swing dancing. She'd never done swing dancing in her life but she'd taken tap and ballet and jazz and she figured she would either piece it together or make a fool of herself. So she said, sure. And the director said to the choreographer, give her the combination and if she can do it, she's got the job. Well, she got the job as a featured dancer and she gets royalty checks every single year. So I had learned that you say yes, when it's that good, when it's your two passions, you don't wait, you don't consider, you don't ponder, you don't make a list of the pros and cons. You say, sure, Thomas Wade Jackson, 
I would be honored to be the producer for your film, and I was. So coming more to a little bit of the present time, March 2019, we had the premiere of the film that you are going to see tonight, A Prayer for Compassion. I look at the sign 2019, and I think, those were the good old days. <laughs> didn't you love 2019? Maybe we didn't know in 2019 how much we should have loved it. But this was the night before Lent was to begin in, in March of 2019. The reason that we chose that night was that a group called um, Millionaire Vegan um, had offered the Pope, Pope Francis, $1 million for charity if he would go vegan for Lent, million dollar vegan, the group is called. Now, I think that if Pope Francis had been left to his own devices, he would have said, absolutely, because he did that beautiful, beautiful papal letter that said, the mother of God weeps for the poor and the animals. This man has a vegan heart. He's also in a very bureaucratic institution. So he didn't go vegan. He didn't take the money, but that was when we had the premiere. And it was such a beautiful experience of seeing what love does, especially the pure, simple love that we can have for animals. You know what? If we were all out at a restaurant, eating our different food, having our different conversations, reading different papers, believing different political ideologies and all the things that make people separate. But then we see that there is a pigeon in distress. You know what's going to happen? Everybody is going to be involved in this situation. Somebody is going to call the wildlife rehab. Somebody is going to go in the kitchen and get a box to put the pigeon in. Somebody is going to be calling their friend who knows all about pigeons because there's something so sweet and so pure about this love that we can have for those who are truly innocent. So at this beautiful premiere for this beautiful film, all kinds of people came from all sorts of cultures and religious traditions. On the left, we have Sarab Dalal, who is a member of the Jain faith, which probably has more to say about Ahimsa than any other religion. You'll learn about it tonight in the film when Thomas travels to India and, and talks with Hindus and, and Jains and, and others there. Then we have vegan Shannon, Shannon Blair, and her amazing precocious son, vegan Evan, and they're Roman Catholic. And I'm shown with Jeffrey Cohan, who is the executive director of Jewish Veg. And while we're looking at this picture, I want to talk a little bit about the dress. You know, they always say that if you ever get to the place in life where you're going to be at an event so glittery that a designer might want to give you a dress just for the night, kind of like Cinderella going to the ball, then you'll really know that you're having a red carpet experience. Well, this dress was on loan from Anna Tagliabue, who has a wonderful couture line of one of a kind vegan clothing. So if you see, it looks like leather, I, not, I like feathers, and the jacket looks like Persian lamb, but it's all vegan. Now it did weigh 12 pounds, so it was quite a workout that night, but really um, an evening to remember. And then the gentleman on the far right is Dr. Silas Rao, whom many of you know, and whom you will be seeing in the film. Now, after it was all over, and things were cleaned up and the food was out and most of the people had left. I got this picture. I'm here with Susie Welch. Maybe you uh, recognize her from the Today Show. She is an evangelical Christian and we are standing with Eric Adams, who is going to be the next mayor of New York City. He cured himself of, of far gone diabetes. He was blind in one eye. He no longer is because of his whole foods plant-based diet. And I think it's some kind of miracle 
that New York City is going to have a vegan mayor. Everything we do brings us a little bit closer to, oh yeah, this is normal. This is how things are. It's not like, oh, I'm a vegan. Everybody else is something else. No, we want to get to the point where people eat plants. I think it's going to be a little bit the way smoking cigarettes is now. When I was growing up, everybody's parents smoked. Certainly everybody's dad and almost everybody's mom and all of those fancy people in the movies. Well, anybody who smokes now is, is huddled against a building protecting themselves from the snow and everybody who walks by feels sorry for them. I wonder how many times they've tried to quit. I hope next time they make it. I think it's going to be like that with meat, that it won't be illegal. Some people will still have access to it, but it will be so rare and so unrespected that it's going to fall away. But we're not going to just sit around and let it fall away. No, 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 no. We're going to be out there doing everything that we can to bring about that day when eating plants is normal and eating animals is seen for what it is. It's not God's plan. It's not going to save the planet. It's not going to save us. Florence Scovel Shin, if you're in unity, you know who she is, said, good shall follow good and miracle shall follow miracle and wonders never cease. Now, when I used to read that, I would think, Florence, you're cool, but that's wishful thinking. Now, I like Florence Scovel Shin's writings a lot. And in one anthology of her work, they actually put the address where she had lived in New York City in the 1920s and 30s. It's not too far from where I live. It's on Fifth Avenue in the 90s, just across from Central Park. So one day I took myself on a junket to Florence's building. I was there to find the plaque or something that said that she had lived there. So I was all excited and I tripped into the building and I said, I'm here to see some evidence that the famous writer Florence Scovel Shin lived in this building. And the doorman looked at me like, it's going to be one of those days. He said, we've got no Shin here. I said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. This was 80, 90, 100 years ago. Isn't there a plaque? Isn't there something? He said, I don't know a Shin. And I walked out feeling sad because here is someone whose writing has affected my life and lots of other people. To me, she's famous and she ought to have a plaque. But you know what? She doesn't need a plaque because she's been dead for many, many years. And right now we're thinking about her because of something she wrote, something she said. So this is what we can all do. We can maybe make a film like Thomas. We can maybe write. We can maybe talk. We can maybe influence others. Maybe we can cook. Maybe we can bring some of this amazing vegan food to other people and get them to see, wow, this isn't just okay. This is fantastic. That's probably what you're finding at a Unity Village this weekend on your retreat. And when I think of what Florence Scovel Shin wrote, good shall follow good and miracle shall follow miracle and wonders never cease, I think that's a vegan world. That's when we'll see everyone as equal. That's when justice and equity will just be so normal that if ever a little bit of it doesn't show up, we'll be absolutely shocked and appalled. And we'll see all life as sacred. It doesn't matter if somebody is a pig or a chicken or a pigeon. I live with a rescue pigeon. His name is Thunder. He's blind in one eye. That's why he doesn't go outside. He has interests. He has needs. He has preferences and he expresses them. 
I think if for 10 seconds, humans knew what's going on with everybody, what's going on with these wonderful persons of the animal world, nothing would be the same again. It was like that night in the park when I saw Ahimsa and Satyagraha, and I couldn't continue my life the way it had been going. I think if we could see, if we could just get a glimpse of what is going on with God's other creatures, nothing would ever be the same. So all of you at the retreat have the opportunity tonight to see some of that. And I have to say there are some scenes in A Prayer for Compassion that'll break your heart. But you know how they say if you break your leg, it's stronger afterwards? Hearts are like that too. And what you'll also see in this beautiful film are people from virtually every religious tradition who get it, that whatever the teaching is, whatever the sacred scripture, whatever the holy book, whatever the traditional lineage, if you look for it, it's in there. It's in there that we do much, much better cooperating with God and nature by eating plants. Everybody does better when love prevails. And when it does, you know what's going to happen? Good shall follow good. And miracle shall follow miracle. And wonders, well, they're just not going to cease. So thank you all very much for spending this time with me. I had my wonderful clock set up, my actual clock clock like we used to have with hands, but evidently its battery fell out. So I don't know if I have spoken for too long or too short. I'm looking at the time here. I think I've talked for just right. So I'm going to stop because you know what you guys have coming up? The most magnificent film that you're going to see until... Gosh, tomorrow, when I think maybe you're going to see another one. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Thank you so much, Victoria. We're just delighted that you could join us tonight. So wonderful to see you and to hear you. And also wanted to thank you from the bottom of our heart that you could be here with us in spirit, which is the most important. It's good to be in spirit, and it would be really good to be in three dimensions. So we'll give you a virtual hug for now. And <laughs> I'll take it. We will eventually give you a, a real one. And oh. Carol, did Have you a great weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. Hi, Victoria, thank you. Hi, thank you.